All right, it's time for Bible study tonight, and we're just going to open with a word of prayer and get started. Father, we thank you so much for your many blessings. We ask that you would bless our time together as we search the scriptures, as we look into this ancient book, as we build a bridge from the ancient text to the us, to us that are sitting in these pews. Father, help us to look at the ancient people, look in antiquity, to see how you moved and how you bless your people and help us to draw, Lord, the principle from the word of God that we can use in our life every day. We promise to give you credit, glory, and honor. Bless this ministry. Bless those that are here, those that are on the highway. Bless Elder Dyer, Mother Ernestine, and that family that will be traveling down south tomorrow, Lord. Take them safe and bring them back safe. All those that are not well among us, Lord, we pray that you would bless them and strengthen them. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. Lesson number 10. Dealing with the wisdom of Solomon. And we're looking at building the temple. Lesson number 10. Lesson number 10. And it says right under the subject, meticulous instructions from God requires meticulous acts of obedience. So as I was thinking about this lesson and how should we approach it and how should we look at it and what is God saying to us and I just think that golden text text first Kings chapter 6 verse 11 and 12 it really ministered to me personally and it said the word of the Lord came unto Solomon saying concerning this house which thou art in building if thou would walk in my statues and execute my judgments and keep all my commandments to walk in them then will I perform my word with thee, which I spake unto David thy fathers. So this lesson now can be broken up into three different sections. The lesson is coming from 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 5 through 18. It talks about the wise preparation for building. Point number two would be the temple is built. That's in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 11 through 13. 2 Chronicles 3, verse 1 through chapter 4 through 22. <clears throat> and then the last section uh, is God's presence fill the temple. 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1 through 14. So this is building the temple. This is the first temple that is being built. <laughs> this is the first temple that's being built. Before this time, God did not live in a building they didn't have a house for God so they built this temple it was in the heart of David to build God a house but David was a man of war and he was fighting all around and God said no David you're not gonna build me a temple but your son Solomon one of your descendants will and so Solomon came about and God said Solomon will build me a house and when Solomon ascended to the kingship, God gave Solomon wisdom because he humbled himself and wanted God to help him because of, not because of he was so righteous, but, but because he humbled himself and realized he needed God's help. And the Bible said God gave him the wisdom and it mesmerized people in the known world. Now here it is, Solomon has a desire to build God a house. And if you ever had a big building project, and I remember building this church, there's a whole lot of work go into thinking about all of the different specs and aspects and different people that you're gonna need to get this building built. So there's a lot of thought that go into building a big structure, a building, or a church. And so Solomon was getting ready to build. In the first section, 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 1 through 18, is talking about the preparation for building, the preparation for building. And Solomon knew his father had a, another friend that was a king when he was living. Solomon made some um, deal with this other king to get trees and cedar and get some of his men to help him build the temple. And, um, and so his name was Haram. And so 
he did, they built the temple. This is chapter number, 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 1 through 18 is really all about. And Solomon builds this temple. He says, hey, God has put it in my heart. But one thing about it, and they, they would go and work for four months out of a year. They would build, they had stone cutters. They had people who knew timber. Uh, they got trees from the mountains of Lebanon. Lebanon had tall oak trees, and the Canaanites, uh, the Zidonians were people who were skilled in wood, and, um, and so they built this temple in a place called Mount Moriah, which is on the east side of Jerusalem. Mount Moriah is where they built the temple, the first temple. So they built this temple, and God then appears to Solomon, and tell Solomon and rehearse the promise that he gave to his father, David. He said, David, he says, the promise God gave David was, your descendants will rule forever, and they will, they will always be on the throne, and they will never, never not be one of your descendants on the throne, unless your people, your descendants, disobey me and don't serve me. And so it was a promise with condition. It was a promise with condition. And then he comes and he tells Solomon the same thing. Solomon, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to bless you. But it's with condition. And when he built the temple, it's the same thing. Uh, it's with condition. So when I was thinking about that, so how many times God tells us something, and we just hear what God says, but then we don't get the condition part. Because anytime God blesses us with something, there's always a warning. Now, I'm going to bless you, but if you don't do this, then this will happen. I'm going to bless you with this, but if this doesn't happen, that will happen. So you would, God was true to his word. The Babylonians came, took these people into captivity, took over the city, burned the city with fire, because for four generations, they went worshiping other gods. And God had to deal with them. So... If, you would, if we would just look at the text, um, the first text where God promised David was in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, 13, and 16. Let's look at what God was saying. Again, we should, we should look at this and learn from these people and get the blessing, uh, get the wisdom for our own lives. And when thy days be fulfilled, this is God talking to David, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. Right? Verse 13. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. How? Forever. Then it goes on down to verse 16. If you jump to verse 16. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established. How? Forever before thee, thy throne shall be established forever. Now, that's the promise God gave to David. In 1 Chronicles 17, verse 12, verse 11 through 14. 1 Chronicles 17, 11 through 14. Let's read. And it shall come to pass that when thy days be expired, that thou must go to be with thy fathers, I will raise up what? Thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, and I will what? Establish his kingdom. Verse 12. He shall build me what? A house, and I will establish his throne. How? Forever. Verse 13. I will be his father, and he will be my son, and I will not take I would not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him that was before thee. Verse number 14. But I will settle him in my house and in my kingdom, how? Forever. And his throne shall be established forever. Now, if you look at 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, God, that's God talking to David. Solomon is David's son. So, so uh, no, but David, before David, this is David, before David dies, he repeats the message to his son, and he's telling his son the promise that God has talk, told him. 
So he's telling his son, he's getting ready to die, and he's telling his son, son, if you honor God, God will bless you. Now the days of David did what drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, verse 2, what does he say? I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. Verse 3. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou may, what, prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. Verse number four. That the Lord may continue his word which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to thy way and walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. So God, David, God make this promise to King David. David, I'm going to establish your throne forever. You're, you're going to have a royal dynasty. But it's with condition. When David gets old and gets ready to die, he says, son, come here. Show yourself a man. Be strong. Follow the ways of God. And God will bless you. I'm relaying the promise to you. Right? And then in 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 4 through 9, then God appears to Solomon and rehearsed the promise to him with conditions. 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 4. And this is God now talking to David's son, right? Solomon. If thou would walk before me as David thy father walked, in what? Integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded thee and will keep my statutes and my judgments, this is God. He's rehearsing the same promise to David's son. Verse 5. Then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel. How? Forever. As I promised to David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. Read. But if ye shall at all turn, from following me. It's a promise with what? Conditions. Ye are your children and will not keep my commandments and my statutes, I, which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods, little G-O-Ds, and worship, give your affection to them, verse 7. Then I will cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them. Just think about that. I promise you all of this, but if you don't follow me, you're going to be cut off. And this house which I have hollowed for my, this holy place, I will cast out of my sight. Think about what God is saying to, to Solomon. And Israel shall be a proverb and a byword um, people are going to look at him and say, mm, what happened to those people? Huh? Verse 8. At this house, which is high, e everyone that passes by it shall be astonished and shall hiss, and they shall say, why hath the Lord done thus unto this land and to this house? Verse 9. And they shall answer, why? Because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought forth their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and have taken hold upon other gods, and have worshipped them, and served them. Therefore hath the Lord brought up all them, all this evil. And the cross reference to that is in uh, is in Chronicles chapter 6 and verse 12. So the point that I want to make as, as God promised to build a house, it's a promise with conditions. I was telling a bishop today, I said, how, how different things would be 
if we were taught when we first come into God that the decisions we make, the things we're going to do, the role we take, the choices we make can have an effect on our future. And what we do in the church, just let me put this out there. We focus so much on just being saved. That's good. And going to heaven and God has forgiven me. Wonderful. But God could have had um, a dynasty prepared for you. But because of some of the decisions and the things we make, we don't qualify for that anymore. But we're saved. We're going to heaven. But we're not, we don't have all that God blessed because every action requires a reaction. And some of the things we going through now is not that it's the devil, it's the consequences of choices. And the Bible did say, whatever I sow, I'm going to reap. So I can't pray away something that is a consequence. Thank God for Jesus. God would give me grace to go through it. God would give me strength to handle it. But I got, this is a consequences of something I did. Does that make sense? So God had one idea for David and his family. He said, but if they turn away from me, I'm going to cut them off. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, this beautiful house you're building with the glory of God, it's going to be like a, 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 a just an a old banded building. And people are going to wonder what in the world happened. Grass going to grow over this. My glory is not going to be there. And I believe sometimes because we're saved and we have God and God loves us and we have a promise from God, we feel like, oh, I'm going to get the promise anyway. Not so. It's with condition. If I turn aside from God, I forfeit what God has for me, but I can still be saved. See, sometimes we just focus on, well, am I saved? Am I going to heaven? Am I forgiven? Yeah, but God may have called, wanted you to walk on this level while you're here, but your choices, that's why in the beginning of your walk with God, you have to be careful of the choices and the decisions you make because it can cause you to forfeit things in the future. Now, that's rich. I wish, well, I'm going to tell you, I heard this when I first got saved. My pastor told us, and that's why I fought so hard not to make wild decisions because I don't believe I'd be where I'm at in God today if I would have just made a whole bunch of decisions up and down, in and out of church, all over the place. Now, well, yeah, I'm saved. God has forgiven me. He loves me. But I'm not walking in that ram or that authority that God has ordained for me. The same anointing that I got filled with the Holy Ghost with, I still have that same. I, I haven't been had to repray me through. No, no, I'm not, making, I'm, not, I'm not making fun of folks. who Thank God people come back to God. But there's something to be said about the original anointing God put in your life. I heard a pastor preach that when he, when he came in for revival. He said, yeah, you get saved, but you don't get that something. You don't get that back. And the more you keep in and out of God, you keep losing something. It's the question not whether God saved. Yeah, you save. Yeah, God loves you. But you lose something. And I sat there in my seat as a young Christian. I thought, I don't want to lose what God has gave me. And for 40 some years, I have kept that same love that I had for God when I first got saved. So I don't want you to just look at salvation in one dimension and say, well, I'm just saved. No, God may have cut some things out, especially for you, but you can't make decisions. And then those decisions, you got to walk back through those choices you made. But God would help you if you hold on to him and he'll take you through. But you can't pray that away. Oh, does that make sense? You can't you can't rebuke that because if I make a decision to go out of the church and lay all around, I'm just using me now. I am not talking about nobody, don't get mad. If I go out of the church and run around and sneak around and all of a sudden start having babies out there, I come back into the church, oh, I'm saved and God loved me, but now uh, child support is getting me. That ain't the devil. That's a, from the consequence. 
if I go out there and run around and pick up a disease that I can't get rid of, I can come back and get saved and go to heaven, but that's a consequence of my choice. It's not the devil, it's the choice I made. I didn't have to go that way, but the choice that I made, there was consequences with it. And sometimes, I don't know if the saints understand, some of the stuff you're dealing with is the consequences of your choices. And so you can't get tired of it. Well, some doors you just don't want to open. Okay, I, let me get back to the house that Solomon built. Because God told Solomon, told David, I'm going to bless you, but you can't build the house. Your son will. And Solomon was not born. See, when you're dealing with God, you're dealing with an eternal being. And God is looking at you in the light of eternity and his plan, not just what we want him to do right now. See, God is dealing with us into his big eternal plan and what he wants to get done. So when God saw David, David, you a man of war, you fight, man, you have conquered. But uh, I'd rather for a son, your son, is going to build me a house. I don't know if you remember reading that. And Solomon got all of the materials together for his son to build. The re now, if you know who Solomon is, some stuff you have to scratch your head with God because Solomon was not born when God promised David that in Samuel. Solomon come through David killing Uriah, taking his wife and having a baby with Bathsheba. The first baby died and then he went on and married Bathsheba and then they had Solomon. Solomon now is the boy that he may have come out of some, you know, unsavory relation, but God had a plan for him. Now this whole issue, I may not, I'm not getting political, but this whole issue of abortion and all that, you don't know why. It may come a bad different way, but God has a, a plan for that child's life. God gives life. And Christians don't, shouldn't get abortion. Christians are conservatives. Thank you for that amen. And, 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 and you know, and so uh, every life is precious and you don't, I told you, God looks into eternity. You don't know why God is allowing that baby to come here. So give him up for adoption or let somebody, but don't kill it. It may be a prophet, maybe an apostle, maybe something, you know. Solomon came this way and he became the king of Israel. Right? And God says, Solomon, you're going to build my house. But then he came to Solomon and said, wait a minute. You asked for wisdom. I gave you wisdom, but I must rehearse something to you. Your descendants will rule forever and nobody would ever defeat you. You'll be a royal dynasty. But if you quit following me, I'm going to cut you off. I'm going to cut you off. I'm going to this house won't mean nothing. All what you do won't mean a thing. If you don't obey me and do what I tell you to do. So the point then, how we leap from this ancient day to us. God may have given us promises, but if you don't obey God, though God don't have to be um, obligated to fulfill those promises. Promises, things come with conditions. He says, this is what the condition look like. If you do this, I'll do that. If you walk upright, no good thing I withhold from you. If you do this, if you do your part, I'm going to do my part. It's a relationship. Amen. All right. So God reminds Solomon of this. And if you look in second, if you look in, uh, uh, um, anyway, let's, let's we stay with the lesson. God <laughs> reminded Solomon that promise was given with a condition. David, Solomon, and their royal descendants must faithfully obey God. If thou would keep all my commandments to the royal family of David, was not, there would be nothing, it was not without condition, there would be nothing God wouldn't do for him. This was not a new revelation. God told David this, that he would repeat it again to Solomon. 1 Kings chapter number 2, verse 3 and 4. We're talking about building the house. We get in the backdrop. First Kings chapter two, verse three, let's read. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God 
to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his judgments and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses, and that thou may prosper in all that thou doest and whatsoever thou turnest thyself. Verse 4, we read it earlier. What did it say? That the Lord may continue his word. Do you see that? That the Lord may continue his word which he spake concerning me, saying, if thy children take heed to thy way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. Look at 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 4 through 9. Man, I'm telling you, what a promise. I hope you can draw something from this, but this blessed me. He said, if thou would walk before me as David thy father walked in integrity, we read that earlier, and in uprightness, and do according to all that I have commanded thee this day, and keep all my commandments and my judgment, that promise that I gave to your daddy is going to come on you. This promise of this church, it will, it will glorify me. And that's what God is looking for us to walk with him and serve him with all our hearts. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 11 through 13. God commitment to the temple that Solomon was building also had conditions. <clears throat> and the word of the Lord came unto Solomon saying, what did it say? Verse 12. Concerning this house which thou art in building. Now, look what God says. If thou would walk in my statutes and execute my judgments and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then will I perform my word with thee, which I spake unto David thy father. See that? Verse 13. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. But the condition was that you walk and be obedient to God. God has blessed us and promised us and sometimes we, we turn and we get off. And then that word, that promise doesn't come to pass in our life. But you know what? Sadly, Solomon backslid in his latter years. Can you imagine getting old and backsliding? And over, and over nearly the next four centuries, his royal successors consistently ignored God's law. My God. In 586 B.C., the nation of Judah came to an end. Send Judah first. Judah mean praise. But Judah came to an end because Judah turned and started worshiping other gods. The Jerusalem ended. The Jerusalem temple was destroyed in 586. The dynasty of King David waned until the coming of Jesus Christ. Many of the Jews who resides in Judah was exiled from Canaan by the Babylonians. Second Kings chapter 24 and chapter 25 tells you how Nebuchadnezzar came up and ransacked Jerusalem and took these people into bondage. All because they did not want to follow God. What do you think about that church people? Isn't that something? God has a promise over your life and that promise will not come to pass if you turn and sometimes the decisions that we make is the consequence that we're suffering <clears throat> that's point number one that's the condition that's preparation then he made uh, um, he made concessions with this other king the king gave him timber they start building he lent men they came and they built this temple now in second Chronicles chapter 3 through chapter 4 to 22, the temple was being built. That's in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 11 through 13, 2 Chronicles chapter 3 through chapter 4 through 22. And let's just read it in our lesson here, the temple being built, First Chronicle, uh, 2 Chronicles 3, 1. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord, the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah. That's where it was. Where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Onan the Jebusite and he began to build in the second day of the second month in the fourth year of his reign 
Now these are the things wherein Solomon was instructed for the building of the house of God. The length of thy cubit after the first measure was three score cubit, and the breadth was twenty cubits. He made the most holy house, the length of, uh, whereof was according to the breadth of the house, twenty cubits, and the breadth thereof twenty cubits. And, the over, and he overlaid it with fine gold, beautiful, among uh, amounting to six hundred talents. And then it says, 419, Solomon made all these vessels that were for the house of God, the golden altar also, and the tablets whereof, and the shoe bread was set. The thing we need to understand is that the, this temple was absolutely beautiful. It was beautiful. Second Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, the temple was built in Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. Chapter 2, 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 2, construction began in the fourth year of Solomon's reign. That's 956 B.C., 968. Verse number 3, the dimensions of the foundation, approximately 90 to, a, 90 to 100 feet long, approximately 30 to 32 feet wide. And verse 4 through verse 17 talks about the porch, the entry, the main entry place. This place was absolutely Fantastic. It had big pillows, had curtains, it had images, it, it had all kinds of things in this place. And God was building it, but God gave him a promise. He said, look, man, don't you turn from following me, but if you serve me, your reign, your descendants will reign forever. Second Chronicles chapter 4 depicts the temple furnishing and equipment. It talks about the altar of sacrifice, the sea, a large water tank in which priests would wash themselves. Uh, it had 10 layers, basins for rinsing utensils, 10 lampstands, 10 tables for holding the bread of the presence of the Lord, 10 bowls, two courtyard doors, an incense altar for ceremonial burning incense, numerous stand, pots, shovels, meat forks, oil lamps, tongues to get the hot coals off the fire, wick trimmers, dishes, censers, all of this stuff. The first temple was a structure of magnificent beauty and grandeur. We should ask ourselves, it was a shrine fit for the Lord, the King of Israel. We should think about our church today. Shouldn't God's house look absolutely beautiful? I, I think the church should look better than my house do. It represents our God. And then they respect the house of God. How do we reverence God's temple? I mean, how do we reverence? People come to church, they just drink water, standing in the church, they chew gum, throw the paper on the floor. They just come and leave. They buy uh, pamphlets out there for the babies. In the I mean, this is God's house. How do we reverence God's house. They, they reverence God's house. In fact, the children of Israel, the ancient people saw when they put in the Ark of the Covenant that that was where God's presence resided. There was the throne of God on earth. They respected. They respected. Amen. Before he died, King David passed on Solomon the design plans for the temple which the Spirit had given him, 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 11 through 19. Now, even though Solomon was not, David was not going to build the church, he gave all the material so his son didn't have to do nothing but build the house. He, 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 he got everything set and gave his son the warning. Now, son, follow God in the law of Moses and you're going to be fine. But if you don't, you're not going to succeed. Now, here's all the timber, here's all the gold, here's all the wood, everything is set. Build God a house, right? Look at 1 Chronicles 28, verse 11 through 19. Let's read together. Then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch and of the house thereof and of the treasures thereof and of the upper chambers thereof and of the inner parlors thereof and of the place of the mercy seat. All of that David did for his son. We talked about legacy. We talked about leaving something. We should leave something for our children. Now, I, I would say something, but we got a diverse group, so I won't. 
But in, in our community, they don't leave us nothing. Everybody got to scratch and, and scrape for everything. I even hear people say, I'm not going to leave you nothing. If you get it, you're going to get it yourself. I'm going to use everything for myself. I'm not leaving you nothing. And I think that is so sad. That's a selfish attitude. You should leave, the scripture said we should leave something for our children's children. Amen. We should leave them an inheritance. And, and so when they come along, they don't have, even their college, some of them are geniuses in our family, but because they don't have money to go to school, they fall into selling drugs. But there was a doctor there. But we need to start putting things in place so we can set things that what Solomon, I mean, David did. David had everything in place. And they tell us when you get ready to have a baby, they got the Gerber plan. By the time they get 18. But you got to be disciplined for that kind of stuff. And most people are not disciplined. We like stuff right away. And if it ain't happening right away, we get anxious and start doing something else. But anything good takes time. It takes time to develop wealth. It takes time to get out of debt. It takes time to build security. It takes time to build reputation with a company. It takes time to build reputation with vendors and people in the community. It ain't gonna happen just because you want it right now. It takes time. So God has to give us patience, right? So let's finish reading, let's finish reading. Verse 12, God, I see how you're looking at me. And, and the pattern of all that he had by the David by the Spirit. So God was in all of it. The Spirit of the Lord gave it to David, and David gave it to his son Solomon. And he didn't get up there and say, son, let me build it. No, he said he knew his place. That was not his role. He did, you know, everything is not my role. We shouldn't be trying to live our lives through our children. Uh-oh, I may be hitting a rut here. Some people live vicariously through their children. I think that's so selfish because you didn't live your life. Why are you taking over somebody else's life? You made your mistake, let them make theirs. Uh, they may not want to be a ballerina, but they out there just dancing and twirling because that's what you wanted to be. They hate being a ballerina, but mama want me to be one and they just hating it. That's wrong. Let them decide. Anyway, he gave him the pattern by the spirit of the Lord, of the courts of the house of the Lord, and of all the chambers round about of the treasures of the house of God, and of the treasures of the dedicated thing. Everything was laid out for this boy. Verse 13. Also for the courses of the priests and for the Levites and for all the work of the service of the house of the Lord, for all the vessels of service in the house. Everything was laid out for this boy. David did it. 14. He, ha he gave a gold, by, he gave of gold by weight of things of gold. And for all instruments of all manner of services, silver also for all instruments of silver by weight and for the all instruments of every kind, it was all there. Verse 15, this stuff blesses me. I don't know about you. You tell me you like the word. This is it, man. Even the weight for the candlesticks of gold and for their lamps of gold, and the weight for every candlestick, and for the lamps thereof, and for the candlesticks of silver by weight, both for the candlesticks, and also for the lamps thereof, according to the use of every candle, every candlestick. David said there, he didn't say, oh man, I'm bored. He said, no, let me use the rest of my days to prepare for the lineage. Lay it, get things in order. And then let me call and give this boy a warning. Let me tell you something, be strong, be a man, and don't forsake God. Yeah. Verse 16, y'all get this, this is the, and by weight he gave gold for the tables of shoe bread and for every table, and likewise silver for tables of silver, tab, tab, tables of silver, read, let's read verse 617. Also pure gold for the flesh hooks and for the bowls and for the cups and for the golden braces and for the, I mean, everything David had. Verse 18, what is it? And for the altar of incense, refined gold by weight and, 
go for the pattern of the chariots and of the cherubims and of, that spread out their wings that cover the ark of the covenant of the Lord. 19, finish read. Man, all this said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me even all the works of this. God had specific things he wanted in his church. And he gave it to David. David written it and he told his son Solomon, this is the way it should look, be. Lord, help him. Today they'll be saying, nah, that's your vision. I don't want to hear it. No, man. Just walk in what God has given you. It appears that Solomon followed those directions closely. 1 Kings chapter 6 through chapter 7. Long chapter, you don't have to read it. And 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and 4. David did what his father gave him to do. And then the third thing is, God's presence then, when he did it, filled the temple because God wanted to come and be among his people. And that's in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1 through 10. The Ark of the Covenant was the last thing they put in place. And when they put that in place, they all of the musicians had on white linen. They had trumpets. They had brace. They, can you, they were hidden symbols. They were making, and the glory of God, they call it the Shekinah came into the temple is the tangible presence of God. God is a liturgical God. God, the word liturgical simply means order. God had, everybody had their order. The priest had their order. Then the, they, had, they processed from Zion, or from the city of David, up into Mount Moriah. And they carried the Ark of the Covenant and they were singing, processing up to, it was magnificent. And then when they got in there, then the Levites, the priests, took that ark into the holy ho of holy place because everybody couldn't go in there. Everybody couldn't go into that inner holy place. You have to be. And they, what they did is when they began to go into the holy place, the scripture said they sanctified themselves. And what that means is they set themselves aside. They fast and consecrated themselves before they handle the things of God. Do we do that today? Do we make sure we're consecrated when we get ready to handle the things of God? Amen. And they, they did that. And then the glory of God came into the house of the Lord. Second Chronicles 5, verse number 1 through 10. Let's just look at that. And then you guys can help me out here. And let me see what you get out of this. Um, amen. King Solomon when this happened, he called all the leaders of the town, all the government leaders, all the family heads, all the patriots. Do, this was during the Festival of Tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's when they dedicated the temple. So let's look at it. Thus all the work of Solomon made for the house of the Lord was what? Finished. And Solomon bought in all things that David, what? His father had dedicated. And the silver and the gold and all the instruments put he among the treasures of the house of God. Verse 2. We're almost done because I want to hear what you have to say. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel. What did he do? Get the elders together. And all the heads of the tribe, all the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel unto Jerusalem to bring up the last piece of furnishing, the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant, I have a, when I went to Israel, I bought a replica. It was a little box with the cherubim wings would cover it, the mercy seat. And in there is where God's presence dwell. That's where God dwells. But now they're making a house for God to be glorified because God didn't have a house until that time. And so now Solomon had built God a house and they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant in and putting it in the Holy of Holies. And then the priest takes it in. And when the priest comes out, all of the musicians with white linen clothes on and tambourines and cymbals begin to sing and glorify God. Then Solomon assembled all the elders and all the heads of the tribes and all the chiefs. He invited all the government leaders and all the people around, all around, and to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, out of Jerusalem, out of down in Jerusalem, which is in which is Zion. Verse 3. Wherefore, all the men of Israel assembled themselves upon the king in the feast, which was in the seventh month. Verse 4. And all the elders of Israel came, and the Levites 
took up the ark. Now the Levites, you know who they are. They were the priests. You couldn't just wake up and say, the Lord called me into ministry. Not during this time. If you wasn't born a Levite, you couldn't be in ministry. The Leviticus, the descendants of Levi, were the priesthood. All right, verse 5. And they bought up the ark and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle. These did the priests and the Levites bring up. Verse 6. Let's read on. What else? Also King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him before the ark sacrificed sheep and ox which could not be told nor numbered for multitude. So you see them being generous to God. They came and they was giving to God. They was giving offerings that would honor God. They were sacrificing and giving offerings to God. Verse 7. And the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place, and the ark arkle of the house into the midst most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubim. Verse 8. For the cherubim spread forth their wings over the place of the Ark of the Covenant and covered the Ark and the staves thereof above. Verse 9. <clears throat> and they drew out the staves of the Ark, and that's the pole that they carried because you couldn't touch that box. It was holy, and you couldn't touch it. So they put this pole through it, and the priest would carry it on their shoulders and put it in his place. And that the ends of the staves were, um, were seen from the ark before the ark oracle, but they were not seen without, and there it is unto this day. Verse 10. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables which Moses put therein at Horeb, which the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt. So what a feast, what a time. All of this stuff is with conditions. All this stuff, all these promises is with condition. I think the golden text says, if we walk upright, God will bless us. The word of the Lord came unto Solomon, saying, concerning this house, and I think about open door, which thou art in building, if thou would walk in my statutes, keep my judgments, and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then I will perform my word unto thee, which I spake unto David thy father. I think, saints, there's a blessing in doing the right thing. It's a blessing in living right. It's a blessing in walking upright, doing the right thing. God's word will be there for us and fight on our behalf.